what's wrong with that one, but this one's working. All right, let's continue singing and praising God together. Page 526.
his show on the road if I didn't have anything else to do. 566. I love it when y'all sound pretty like that. That would make me want to sing all night. Page 566. I know there's five verses, but the song kind of goes quick, so let's just sing them all, amen? Y'all don't mind singing all that. Sometimes the truth hurts, but we need to hear it. 
Uh, Mama used to, when I would scrape myself up real bad, she'd come with alcohol and bandages. And uh, I didn't want her to know I ever got hurt in the first place. In fact, most of the time I tried to hide it, you know. She'd find out from holding my jeans or whatever. But she'd always want to put that medicine on there and put the bandages on there. And I'd tell her, I said, Mama, it hurts. And she'd say, well, you got to have it. It's, it's, it's going to fix it. It's good. I'm going to tell you, the truth is like medicine, and we need to hear it. Amen? So y'all just bear with me. We're going to have a word of prayer real quick because I don't want to attempt this without the help of Almighty God. So quick prayer, and we'll get into 1 Samuel chapter 29. Heavenly Father, help me this evening, please. Lord, I ask you just to fill me up from my head to my toes. Let me be your vessel this evening, Lord. Speak through me. And Lord, help me not to say anything that would hurt anybody or, or that, that would offend anybody, Lord. Let me not say anything you would want me to say standing behind your pulpit. But Lord, give me the, the courage and the gumption to say the things that you would have me to say and to know the difference between the two. And Father, I ask for your help now. I just trust in your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, for them that don't remember, let me give you a quick catch-up to where we're at. <coughs> David had done real well for a number of years, somewhere near 10 years now. He's been running from Saul. Now, I don't know the exact number. Some think it's 7 years, some think it's 10, some think it's 15. But I'm going to guess it's about 10 years. David's been running from Saul, and he's been doing pretty good. He, he, he's had some temptations. He's had some little slip-ups. You remember that whole thing with the priest and all that, lying to the priest and getting the priest family killed him. And he hadn't been perfect. But he'd done a pretty good job of not putting things in his own hands and trusting the Lord. And then I think he just gets weary. And I understand how that must feel because what did Apostle Paul say? He said not to, uh, to be weary and well do it, but to trust the Lord. He would bring us through these things. So... When I read about this, I understand how you get tired sometimes of serving the Lord. You feel like things just never change and nobody notices anyway and you just never do get any kind of appreciation and it's hard. And I understand it's hard. Some of y'all been doing it longer than I have, serving God and struggling and, and you feel like things just ain't never going to be no better and I understand that. But David got to a point to where he took matters into his own hands and said, you know what? That's enough running from Saul. We're going to move into the Philistine land. We're going to live over there with the enemy because it'll give us it'll get us away from Saul. And so here in the prior chapter, David does that. He moves over into the Philistine land while he's living there for a year and four months. The king of Gath, and please understand, I'm not going to get into a history lesson. I just want you to understand the dynamics what's happening so that we can make application by the Spirit to your lives tonight. My, my, my intent is not to teach you history. It's to show you how these things still matter right now today in your lives. So please, listen up. Please understand that there were at least five kings over the Philistines. They didn't have one king over all of them. They couldn't get along enough to do that. So these kings were more like city kings or city governors or city rulers. So you had the king Achish is the one David's been dealing with. But he's not the only king over the Philistines. So he has an agreement with David. And David's living in this little country town right outside of Gath there. And uh, it's supposed to belong to Israel anyway. That whole land is supposed to be Israel's. But they were not obedient. They didn't run the bad guys out. So now they're having to deal with them. But anyway, David is living there outside the will of God for a year and four months. And I want you to understand, up until now, it's worked out for him. Up until now, he's gotten away with it. And friends, sometimes you can live outside of the will of God and you can get away with it for a while. You'll even fool yourself into thinking God's okay with it. Sometimes we go to live in such a way, we think, well, he's not punishing me for it, so he must be all right with it. Friends, nothing can be further from the truth. The Lord does not want you to live outside of his will. He wants you to be right in the center of it. And so when you take matters into your own hands and you get out of the will of God, do not expect that it's going to be uh, lovely forever. Sooner or later, something's going to happen. If you do it long enough, it's going to happen. And it's just the way that it is. So in the last chapter, we noticed that Israel and, Philist and the Philistines are going to go to war. 
And the king of the, this one particular king, King Achish, comes to David. He says, all right, you're going to fight next to me. And we're going to see what you can do. And David says, all right, we'll do that. And now he's in a fix because he's either got to fight against his people, his nation, the one he's going to be king of someday, or he's got to fight against the guy who's been taking care of him for a year and four months. So David's in a predicament. And I want you to watch how God works these things out, but I also want you to see the result of our sin, the result of our compromise, the result of our falling away from the will of God. And you'll see this in chapter 29. Now, at the end of chapter 28, there was kind of a parenthesis there where we see Saul go to a medium, and we talked about that. And I'm not going to go backwards, but if you don't remember that, it's recorded, y'all can go watch it, but... Just understand, that's over now. He knows he's about to die because he's been told. And he knows Israel's about to go to war with the Philistines because he's been told that too. So without further ado, chapter 29, verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain, which is in Jezreel. By the way, this is all the land of Israel, but the uh, Philistines are living here. Anyway, verse 2, The lords of the Philistines... Passed on by hundreds and by thousands, but David and his men passed on the river war with Achish. Now, all that means to you is, as the armies of the Philistines are gathered together on the front line, up comes Achish, the king of Gath, his army, and David and his 600 men show up with Achish at the back of the Philistine army, facing off against his own nation over there. So it's quite a predicament. And I'm not David, but I can just imagine the whole way there he's got to be thinking uh oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? Pretty interesting the way the Lord works here. But pretty, I mean, I've got to ask you when I get to heaven, there is a laundry list of stuff I want to check out, people I want to talk to, questions I want to ask. And the old joke is well, there may be a, a line a thousand years long just to talk to the patriarchs. Well, that's all right, friends. We're going to be there for eternity. Sooner or later, I'm going to get my turn. And I'm going to have to ask David this question. What were you thinking? If God had not intervened, what were you going to do? How are you going to get out of this? You can't fight your own people. You're supposed to be anointed to be the king over them people. And you can't really fight Achish. He ain't done nothing to you. In fact, he's been a pretty good friend. What are you going to do? He's in a mess, y'all. But I love the way God works this out. Verse 3, then said the princes of the Philistines. This is the other cities that are represented. What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said unto the prince of the Philistines, Ain't this David? It says, Is not this David, but, you know, I'm a firm believer that you can put ain'ts in there where they belong. <laughs> ain't this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault in him, since he fell unto me unto this day. You know the sad part of Achish here? He's defending a man that's been lying to him for a year and four months. Now, you don't have to turn there, but if you want to, you can. Back in chapter 27, verses 8 through 12, David had pulled a ruse over his eyes. He had, he had been getting away with some stuff, and I'll read it to you. Again, you don't have to turn there. But 27, 8 says, David and his men went up and invaded the Geshurites. And the Gezrites and the Amalekites. Don't forget that. That's going to come back up. For those nations were of old, the inhabitants of the land, as thou goest to Shur, even under the land of Egypt. And David smote the land, and left neither man nor woman alive, and took away the sheep and the oxen, and the asses, and the camels, and the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. And Achish said, Where have you made a road today? And David said, Oh, against the south of Judah, and against the south of the Jeremoites, and against the south of the Kenites, and David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring tidings to God, saying, lest they should tell him of us, saying, So did David, and so will be his manner all the while he dwelleth in the country of the Philistines. And Achish believed David, saying, He hath made his people Israel utterly to abhor him, therefore he shall be my servant forever. Achish believed everything he said. So when David told Achish, Hey, I'm just going against these bad guys over here, I'm not. Uh, he, or he, what he told him was, I'm going against Israel for you. I'm fighting Israel for you. Well, that wasn't true. He wasn't doing that. So keep in mind, David had done those things, pulled the wool over Achish's eyes. Now, Achish is standing before the Philistine people, before the princes of the army, and he's defending him. 
he's saying to them, this guy's done no wrong. He's been right here next to me. He's been doing good. He's been fighting for us, which is not true. It's just not true, but that's what he says. So anyhow, he, he's really got him fooled. By the way, you can fool people. You don't fool God. And I just want to point that out to somebody who needs to hear. You can fool everybody in this church house about how you're living your life. You do not fool God. You can be one way in here and you can go home and live another way. But I promise you, you'll trick me. You'll trick these folks in here. But you ain't tricking God. He sees how you live your life from day to day, from moment to moment. And what's going to come to pass is we, uh, we reap what we sow. Okay? Anyhow, verse 5, he says, uh, Is not this David? Um, did I read verse 4? I didn't read verse 4. The prince of the Philistines were wroth with him. Wroth is an old English way of saying they were angry. Angry to the point of doing something violent. Wrath and wrath are the same word. One is past tense and one is present tense. I have wrath, I have wrath. It's just an old word, but it's all it means is extreme anger that usually is followed by violence. Okay, so they were they were wroth with him, and the princes of the Philistines said to him, "Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him. Let him not go with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he?" reconcile himself unto his master should it not be with the heads of these men. Now, what, what they're saying here is this has happened, friends. This has happened. Back in chapter 14, verse 21. Don't turn there. Just jot it down read later. But back in chapter 14, verse 21, this had happened. Saul was battling the uh, Philistines and uh, the Hebrews had, some of them had been turncoats. They'd been traitors. They told on their brethren because they wanted to be on the winning side. And then when they saw that God was going to deliver the Philistines into the hand of Israel, well, they switched sides again and said, well, we're brethren, so we're going to jump over here and help our brethren. This had happened to the Philistines before. So they remember that. And they said, oh, we don't want any Hebrews fighting. Their life will change their mind. How many of you have seen the movie Braveheart? <clears throat> There's a scene in that movie, and I just like old historical stuff, especially things about Scotland. There's a scene in that movie where King uh, Edward Longshanks decides he's going to fight against Scotland and he's going to use the Irish and the Welsh to do it. And he sends them out first. And they go running over to them Scots and right before they get there, they stop and shake hands, see? That's what they're afraid of will happen here. They're afraid if David fights with them, they'll get over and see their own people and change their mind. And it might have been what was going to happen. We don't know because God worked it out where it didn't have to happen. Anyhow, so these these uh, these. Philistine rulers, these, these princes said, send this brother home. We don't trust him. And it's crazy. Achish, who has been lied to, Achish, who has been fooled, Achish, who believes in the character of David, is still arguing for him. Look at this. Verse 5, this is their argument against him. Ain't this David, of whom they sang one to another and dances, saying, Saul said, his thousands, David, and his ten thousands. Now listen, that song has come up. At least three times studying this book. You know what that tells me? That was a hit song. <laughs> it was on the top 100 Billboard's hottest songs for years. They even in, in, in the land of the Philistines, they were rocking out to that song. Everybody had heard it. Everybody knew it. It keeps coming over a 10-year period. This thing's been brought up to Saul. It's been brought up to David. Now it's being brought up to the leaders of the Philistines. They keep bringing up this song. Apparently, it was quite a doozy of a song. I don't know how it went. I don't know how the beat was. I don't know who performed it. But I can tell you, it was a hit because everybody had heard it. And now it's being used in an argumentative way to say it's okay for, uh, or, or it's not okay for David to go. They're saying, listen, David is known for killing Philistines. They sang songs about this guy. Oh, and by the way, he killed Goliath, who's a Philistine. Don't trust this guy. So this is the argument they're having. Achish is defending David. These, these Philistine rulers are saying, you're an idiot, Achish. We don't want this guy sending him on. Verse 6. Then Achish called David because he had given in. He said to him, surely, as the Lord liveth. That's interesting to me. Apparently, David had had some influence on this guy. Because he's basically swearing by the Lord God Almighty, and he don't even serve God. He's a Philistine. But I find that interesting. He said, Surely as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, 
And thy going out, thy coming in with me, and the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me until this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. That's an old, long, drawn out way of saying, look, buddy, if it's up to me, you go fight with me. I trust you. We're good. We ain't got no problem. But these guys I'm going with, they don't trust you. They don't want you. They're telling me, send you home. I hate it. I'm sorry. You can't go with us. I know you're going to be disappointed. You can't go with us. Isn't it neat how God works this out to where not only they don't have to fight his own people, they don't want anything. And they're not trying to kill him. They're just telling him, hey, go home. You get a free pass. You don't have to fight nobody today. You don't have to fight with us. We don't have to worry about you fighting against us. Just go home. Stay out of it. So anyhow, that's what happened. Verse 7. Wherefore now return, go in peace, that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said, this is so dumb, but it's ambiguous, and I think I know why he did it. David acts like he's heard about this. He acts like he's heard. You know what I think he really did? Oh, I didn't know how I was going to get out of that. I don't know what I was going to do. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's what I think he was saying on the inside. But here's what he says on the outside. He says, what have I done? What hast thou found in thy servant? So long as I've been with thee unto this day that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my Lord the King. That's an ambiguous statement. The enemies of my Lord the King. He could be talking about anybody. He could be talking about Saul and his enemies, the Philistines. He could be talking about Achish and his enemies, the, 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 the Israelites. He could be talking about God and his enemies, the people who don't follow him, the people who are pagan and, 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 and follow after the devil. So I don't really know who he's talking to. It's such an ambiguous answer. He says, what have I done wrong? And I can't go and fight against the enemies of my Lord. And he doesn't specify which Lord. So I find that interesting. First time, Achish answered and said to David, I know thou art good in my sight. Boy, he's got that man fool. As an angel of God. He said, you're as good as an angel. What a statement. Notwithstanding, the princes of the Philistines have said he shall not go up with us to the battle. So he dodges a bullet here. But listen, this is about to get sad. Okay? I, 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 I wish it was all sunshine and roses. But what's about to happen is not a good thing. However, I want you to know before we get into it, if you'll turn to the Lord, trust the Lord, follow the Lord, He'll work it out. It always, it always. My, my granny used to say, and I didn't fully understand it when I was young, but I understand it now. She always used to say, it'll all come out in the Lord. And she didn't say wash, she said wash. That's the way she talked. That was the proper way to talk when I was coming out. Then, it'll all come out in the wash. All right, verse uh, 10. Wherefore now rise up early. He says, you go home early in the morning with thy master's servants that are come with thee. And as soon as you be up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now, this is sad. But remember, if you're with the Lord, you trust the Lord. you take care of it. So watch this. Verse 1. It came to pass when David and his men were coming to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burnt with fire. Their wives and their sons and daughters were taken captive. David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, which we studied earlier in the, in, in the book. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Let me stop there. And just explain why this is happening. You spend a year and four months among the enemy. It's the equivalent of a Christian trying to live world. This is what will happen. My granny also used to say, you can't lay with the dogs and not get up with fleas. It just, it just is the way, the way that it is. You can't lay with dogs and not get fleas. 
and you can't go live in the world or get your Christian live like the world and not have something happen. I have had opportunities. And I'm not, this is not meant for me to brag on me. I'm just saying, there have been times and opportunities where there was either more money, more seeming opportunity, maybe the grass seems a little greener somewhere else in a larger community somewhere that seems like it might be better. But somebody told me one day, said, Chad, if the grass is greener on the other side, it may be because there's a major water line break or maybe even sewage under there. <laughs> something to consider. Sometimes the grass is greener, but it's greener because something's wrong, right? It's greener because something's broke. It's greener because something stinks under the surface. So I, I want you to understand, just because you think something's better somewhere else doesn't necessarily mean God wants you to do it. And I don't believe for a moment God wanted David to move his family and his friends, his army, to the Philistine camp to live amongst the Philistines. I believe he wanted him to stay in Judah. I said the same thing about the Apostle Paul, and, and we can argue to the cows come home. I believe he was out of the will of God when he tried to go to Jerusalem and God warned him in Rome. He could have planned him a trip to Rome, and then according to, uh, to Romans chapter 15, possibly even Spain, and headed that way in peace, and God would have been with him. But what did he do? He made it his... Uh, his intent to go to Jerusalem and try to fight for the Jews that had already protected. Look, you know how arrogant it is to think you're going to change the mind of the people who crucified Christ? Hmm. Those people crucified our Savior. Paul says, I'm gonna, I love them. I'm going to go there and we're going to save them. I, I'm going to stand for Jesus and they're going to get saved. He liked the guy himself killed. And then he spent some time in prison. And he wound up where God wanted him to go anyway, but he had to do it the hard way when he could have done it the easy way. Here's the message. If you don't get nothing else out of what I'm telling you, you go mine. Look, I'm not upset at Colin Kaepernick. You know why? Because he's just getting started on what's going to happen anyway. All that kneeling and stuff he did, he better get good and used to it because the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if Colin Kaepernick wants to start kneeling early, bless God, he better get used to it because he's going to be kneeling for a while. Amen. 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 He ain't the only one. He's the one got that started in him. I didn't mean to get on Colin Kaepernick. I don't care about him. You don't know who he is, good. <laughs> you don't need to know who he is. But listen. Just because things seem better in Philistine land don't mean you ought to go. I'll say this too. I've considered this. If I got an opportunity in town, First Baptist Church or wherever, big church, big office, lots of room, if I had that opportunity, you know what would scare me the most? Raising daughters in town. Okay? <laughs> Keep me up at night. Scares me plumb to death. I'd rather be out here where nobody would mess with my girl. Because I don't trust this world. There's a six-year-old. A six, I'm going to say it again because it's so crazy. A six-year-old little boy shot his teacher in Virginia. And when he shot her, he said, I killed that blankety blank. A six-year-old. When they disarmed him, he told the person that disarmed him, I killed her blankety blank. You know, because he didn't kill her, by the way. She lived. She lived. She's still in school for $40 million. Good job. That happened in Virginia. A six-year-old don't got no business having a gun. This is the world we live in. You think I want to move my family to town? He shouldn't be talking about We ain't country enough. We need to get further away from town. Amen. Listen, there's a point to this. Sometimes we take matters into our own hands and think we know what's best for us. If you don't believe me, look at Lot. Lot made up his mind that the grass was greener in Sodom. And look what happened. Listen, when, when Lot come out of there, he made it out with two little girls, and that's it. He had at least, at least six children we know of. At least six, maybe more. We know that because the Bible says he had two sons. They stayed behind he has daughters-in-law. They're gone. 
And I believe he had two married daughters too. I could be wrong. Uh, it's, in, it's in Genesis 19 if you want to study 18 and 19 if you want to study it. But the last time I looked at it, I remember coming to the determination that him and his wife had at least six kids, maybe more. And that's why Abraham said, Lord, if there be ten, will you save it? He said, I'll do it for ten. They wasn't even ten people he could save out of Sodom. And that, what, what happened is Lot got out of there barely with his life. And he lost his family was destroyed. And all kinds of bad stuff happened to him. Listen, David had moved to Philistine territory. And now his family, his wives, whatever children they had, 600 of his men and their families are all carried off into captivity. Why? Because he's running around the Philistines. The Amalekites were smart. They were like Comanche Indians. I'm not kidding, or Apaches. They were the type of savages that would wait until nobody's home and raid your place. You know, that, that, that bunch are still out here. Come Christmas time, if they think you're out of town, guess what they'll do? They'll go in there and raid your place. That's the kind of people the Amalekites were. Long before there was a Comanche Indian or Apache Indian or a Kiowa Indian, long before we had any of them mess, we had Amalekites that would do the same thing. They'd wait till the armies were gone, say, woo, it's going to be easy. We're going to take the women and the children and the crops and the, and the animals and anything of value. We're going to get it and run off with it. And we'll be gone for them, even though he's here. And they'll never catch us. You'll see where I'm going with that in a minute. David was running with the wrong crowd, living out of the will of God. And you know what he did right in all this? Everybody's greatly distressed. Everybody's upset. Everybody's ready to kill him. According to verse 6, I'll read it again. David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke astounding him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. That was the only thing he did right. In this type of mess that he's in, he turned to Almighty God for comfort. You know, too many people will turn to everything else. They'll turn to the bottle for comfort. They'll turn to drugs for comfort. They'll turn to uh, all kinds of other wicked things. But David turned himself and encouraged himself in the Lord. It scares me to death thinking about their kids being taken off like that. If that had been my sons and my daughters, God help me, I don't know what. I don't even want to think about it. And y'all don't either. But, praise God, the story gets better from here. Verse 7, David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray you, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. Now, that don't mean anything necessarily, y'all. It just means David is preparing to hear from God. He wants a priest wearing the ephod, which is, uh, without getting into it, it's one of the rituals they use to approach the Lord. Because the Lord is holy and men are wicked. So it was, a, it was a process that you went through. Verse 8. David inquired at the Lord. This is, listen. I wish he'd have done that before he moved to the Philistine land. I wish he'd have done that before he made some of the bad decisions he's made. And listen, I wish we would do that before we'd step out into life and, and, and not have the Lord's will in mind and not be doing things the way we ought to be doing them. I wish we would all inquire of the Lord first. But I can't even help what we've already done. What I can say is, praise God, He's doing it tonight. Sometimes we misstep. Sometimes we get out of the will of God. Sometimes we do things we know good and well. We ain't got no business doing it. Sometimes we go places we know good and well. We ain't got no business going. But when you come to yourself and realize that, inquire of the Lord. And David does that here. He's saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him, said, pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. Boy, I bet you there wasn't a better feeling in the world except for actually accomplishing it than being told by God, I'm with you, you're going to get it all back. Listen to me. I want to be very clear here. You're going to see at the end of this story, they recover everything lost, so that's good. I don't know how many days passed I don't know what abuse these people had to go through. I don't know what kind of torture they endured. I don't even have to explain to a room full of adults the types of things that savage men do to women. You cannot imagine what these people went through. The only comfort in this story is that they get saved. They get delivered. But they would not have had to endure all that 
if they've been where they belong to begin with, if they've been in the will of God to begin with. There is so much we can avoid in this world if we'll just stick close to the Father. And I hope you'll think about that as we look through this life. There's a whole lot of mess we go through we don't have to go through. But praise God, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and like Granny said, it'll all come out before us. Verse 9. So David went, he and his 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. Now you're going to see what that means in a minute, so I'll move on. David pursued. He and 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint, they could not go over the brook. Now here's what's happening. I mentioned, and I kind of wish Mike was here because he'd appreciate this. He likes history like I like history. You can read about some uh, things that happened in American history where the Indians would sometimes run off with people and because they could move quick and light, you couldn't catch them. They just had a way of only packing what they had to have. Nor like us. Listen, we can't go out of town for two days without taking the car or loading it down with luggage because I'm married. You know, we have to have all this stuff. But anyway, seriously, sometimes... I have learned, if I want to get somewhere, I'm better off going by myself. Because I can get there. You take some folks with you and they slow you down. So what's happening here is, as they're pursuing after these bad guys, the bad guys are moving faster because they're not stopping to smell the roses. And David in his pursuit, listen, if you're traveling at the same speed, you'll never catch them. You'll never catch them. You'll never catch them. You've got to be traveling faster than they are overtake them. And the whole time they're traveling, they're thinking about all the stuff their kids are going through, their wives are going through. And I bet you they're not sleeping at night. They're not stopping long enough to cook the food. They're not eating good. They're worried. You ever been so worried and upset you can't eat? Mm -hmm. You ever been so worried and upset you can't sleep? Well, you can imagine how they must feel. Well, that'll take a toll on your body. When they get to this brook here, 200 of them said, we can't go any further. We're just, we're, 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 we're dead on our feet. We got to stop. 200 of them stayed there. And the other 400 went on. And you'll probably see next week um, how that turns out. We won't get that far. But anyhow, let me go a little further. This is interesting. Verse 11. They found an Egyptian in the field. He was outstanding in his field. <laughs> Thank y'all for laughing at my silly dreams. Anyway. They brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water. And they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins and when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him. For he had not eaten bread or drunk any water for three days and three nights. This man was on the verge of death. He had not eaten. He had not drank. He was abandoned out there and it's a wonder he even lived. But they found him and they gave him nourishment and they got him talking. Verse 13. David says to him, To whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? That means who are you and where are you from? That's all it means. He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. Ooh, this gets interesting. This is who we're looking for, the Amalekites. And my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. Now, this gives him a whole lot of information. Number one, enemies three days ahead of you. Number two, they're in such a hurry, they're dropping slaves off. They can't make the trip. They're not waiting on nobody. If you're sick or wounded or weary, you'll get left because they are moving, folks. So now, now he's got some idea which direction to go. He's got some idea how fast they're moving. He's got some idea how far go, or, or, away they are. Look at this. Verse 14. We made an invasion. This guy's just telling everything. <laughs> we made an invasion upon the south of the Carathites and upon the coast which belonged to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burnt Ziklag with fire. Woo! I'd probably just slap him right there. I mean, think about it. He just admitted to being party to what took place with your people. That's not fun. He says, verse 15, David said to him, Can you bring me down to the company? And he said, Swear unto me by God. I love how everybody remembers to swear by God when they're in a mess. Because the rest of the time they're serving little G gods. But this is capitalized in my Bible. Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master. And I'll bring you to this company. I hope you get there. Verse 16. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating, drinking, and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. They were moving really fast and then I guess when they got to where they thought they were going, they thought they were safe. They thought nobody was coming after them. 
They stopped to have a party, and that's going to be their undoing. David smote them from twilight even to the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, except for 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And for them that don't know, camels are faster than they look. So they 400 of them got away. Verse 18, And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drove before those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. Now, we're going to stop there for tonight and finish this next week. But here's what I want you to know. I'm so thankful God helped David recover his wives and their kids, and his men's wives, and kids, sons and daughters. But you don't get to take back all that they endured. You don't get to take back all that worry and heartache that David and his men suffered. You don't get to take back the fact that they were to the point of killing David, and all because they were out of the will of God. It's easy. It's easy to veer off. But there is no temptation taken from you, but that is common to man. The Lord will not allow you to be tempted above your age, above what you're able, and He'll make a way to escape. But that's what the Bible teaches. So as we live in this world with all this stuff going on, and it's getting bad, just remember: if you'll follow the will of the Lord, if you'll do what thus saith the Lord, if you'll study your Bible and do right, you can avoid the heart. And if you find yourself out of the will of God, you find yourself living the way you shouldn't, watching things you shouldn't, listening to things you shouldn't, doing things you shouldn't, it ain't too late. Turn back to God. Surrender to Him. I can say this, and I'm through. My granny used to say this to me when I was a young man. She used to say, and I quote her a lot, because I loved her, and she loved God. And my granny used to say this, Chad, if, if, if Jesus came back today, could you open the door and let him in the house? Or would you have to say, hold on, Lord. I'll let you in a minute. i got to turn this off, turn that off, change the channel, unplug something, hide something. Would you have to spend a little while making it okay for Jesus to come in? Or could you just open the door and say, come on in, Lord. I've been looking for you lately. She asked me that to get me thinking, and I'm asking you to get you thinking. Are you prepared for the coming of the Lord because He's coming soon? Are you living in His will? And if not, why not? Something to think. Brother Bob, I'm going to turn this thing off. Would you close this with a word? Brother Father, Lord, we live in these end times, Lord. See the culmination of your form of the ages.